It's a delight for me to be with you this morning to share in the service as well. Friends, my theme this morning is called to be saints. And I invite you to have your Bibles open or your electronic devices. They seem to have a few of those these days. My text is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, where Paul opens up by saying, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. The city of Corinth was situated on a narrow neck of land only six kilometres across. It stood at the junction of land routes running north and south and at the junction of sea routes running east and west. This made it one of the great trading and commercial centres in the first century AD, the, the Singapore of the Mediterranean world, if you like. According to Dr. James Moffat, Greeks, Latins, Syrians, Asiatics, Egyptians and Jews bought and sold, laboured and revelled, quarrelled and hobnobbed in the city and its ports as nowhere else in Greece. Corinth also had an unenviable reputation for loose living. The Greeks coined a special verb to play the Corinthian, which found its way into the Greek language. It meant to live a life of unbridled licentiousness. Behind Corinth was a mountain nearly 600 metres high, the volcano-shaped Acro-Corinth, on which stood the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. To that temple were attached a thousand prostitutes who came down from the, the mountain in the evenings to ply their trade <clears throat> on the streets of the city. No wonder it had such a reputation. It, <clears throat> it was to this cosmopolitan melting pot that a Jewish couple came in around AD 50. They had lived in Rome for some years, but a recent outburst of rioting among some of the Jews there had given the Emperor Claudius the opportunity to impose restrictions on the Jewish community which were tantamount to expulsion. Aquila and his wife Priscilla were tent makers by trade and before long they settled themselves in an open fronted shop with their living quarters upstairs. When Paul came to Corinth, he soon became acquainted with this couple because he had learned the same trade as they had. He was received with open arms, invited to lodge in their cramped quarters and to work at his trade along with them. Aquila and Priscilla became two of Paul's staunchest allies. The three of them went to the Jewish synagogue the next Sabbath and Paul eagerly accepted an invitation to expound the lessons from what we nowadays call the Old Testament scriptures. Luke writes, he held discussions, he dialogued, that's the word that he uses, he dialogued in the synagogue every Sabbath trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. The burden of his message was that the Messiah long, promised long ago in the Old Testament scriptures was none other than Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified, but had been raised to life again. Now ascended to the right hand of God the Father, he would one day return to judge the living and the dead. Paul's hearers were urged to put their trust in Jesus as Lord, for, as the scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But the message encountered fierce opposition and abuse from many of the Jews. So Paul, in a symbolic gesture, shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And now Paul had to find another place in which to teach. But he didn't have to look far. One of the God-fearing Gentiles who had listened to him with pleasure a Roman citizen named Titius Justus lived right next door to the synagogue. 
He placed his house at Paul's disposal and this became Paul's new preaching base. Imagine that. (laughs) Setting up in opposition to the synagogue right next door. That would not have gone down well. Many members from his former synagogue audience now came to this rival meeting place and continued to pay eager attention to what he had to say. Large numbers of other people living in Corinth also flocked to hear him. Those who believed his message were formed into a new Christian community and were baptised. But Paul became uneasy. He felt that the pattern set in previous cities was about to be repeated. Rejection by the Jews, progress among the pagans, fury from the Jews, expulsion by mob violence or judicial process just as the gospel was gaining a foothold. He dreaded the prospect of another beating or stoning and the desolation of being flung out again. A feeling of depression descended on him. Was the Christian faith just smoke and mirrors after all? Was Jesus really raised to life again? The temptation to quit the field and withdraw to some quiet place must have seemed overwhelming. And then Paul heard the same unmistakable voice he had heard on the Damascus road. This time the voice was quiet and reassuring. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for 18 months. Let's come now to the letter that he wrote to them, or one of the letters that he wrote to them. It is directed to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy or, if you like, called to be saints. What does this imply? Well, let me suggest four things this morning, all starting with W, using apt alliteration's artful aid. It implies, firstly, a welcome to the family of God. The word called is an, is an important one for Paul, It was his favourite word for the start of the Christian life. He meant called by the Spirit of God, not by some preacher. The church comprises those whom God himself has called by name. God's invited guests, if you like. He calls them to be sanctified, to be set apart for him, to be saints. The church consists of saints in the making, though it becomes painfully clear from reading this letter that in the Corinthian church, the process was far from complete. A brief glance at the outline of the letter will show that Paul had to deal with matters such as disunity, sexual immorality, church discipline, lawsuits, and disorders in public worship. It had its problems. But Paul is, as it were, looking at his readers through bifocal glasses. With one lens, he sees them as they are. With the other, he sees them as they can become through the indwelling Spirit of God. But what is the family of God into which new Christians are welcomed? Well, friends, it's a worldwide family. It embraces all those all over the world who acknowledge Jesus as Lord. It includes all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's letter was addressed not to the church of Corinth, but to the church of God in Corinth. To Paul, any individual congregation, whatever its location, even in Yapoon (laughs) or in Brisbane, each church, whatever its location, was a part, a local unit of the one church of God. As a local unit of the church worldwide, the believers at Corinth were made to feel their spiritual kinship with all other believers everywhere. It would be good, you know, for us to sit down sometime and think about the implications of that. 
we are members of a whole body of people all over the world who acknowledge Jesus as Lord. The implications are mind-boggling. To be one of God's people is to be part of a worldwide family of those who acknowledge Jesus Christ as Saviour, Sanctifier and Lord. This worldwide family includes the church militant, that is, believers still here on earth, that's you and me, as long as we're on the right side of the grass. But it also includes the church triumphant, believers who have completed their earthly course. One family we dwell in him, one church above beneath, though now divided by the stream, the narrow stream of death. One army of the living God, to his command we bow. Part of his host have crossed the flood and part are crossing now. Being a saint, if you like, being one of the, the church of God implies a welcome. We are part of his family with all that that implies. Our calling as saints implies, secondly, that each of us has a work to perform for God. We're not meant to be idle. God's calling to be saints involves serving him. The motto of the Salvation Army is saved to serve. Now, before I go any further, let me remind us all of one thing. Our, ser <clears throat> our service for God is not a condition of salvation. It is the fruit of our having been saved. We are saved not by the works we perform, but by God's gift of his son, which we gratefully receive with the open hand of faith. Let me say it again. Our service for God is the fruit of our having been saved. In this letter, Paul is able to thank God because the Corinthian Christians have been enriched in every way in all their speaking and all their knowledge, verse 5, with the result that they do not lack any spiritual gift. The Corinthian church was probably the most spiritually gifted church in all of the, um, in all of the uh, churches to which Paul wrote. Friends, when God calls us to serve him, he equips us. He wants us to make full use of the spiritual gifts he has given us. Later in this letter, Paul will have more to say about what those gifts are. But for what purpose were they given? Well, let's be clear firstly that they were not given for arrogant self-display. There will always be the temptation to parade our abilities and giftedness in order to impress others. Look how gifted and clever I am. Paul takes the Corinthians to task for this attitude. A few chapters later he says, didn't God give you everything you have? Well then how can you boast as if what you have were not a gift. Chapter 4, verse 7. Nor did God give spiritual gifts to his people in order to foster an attitude of competitiveness or independence. I've got better gifts than you have. I don't, we don't need your gifts. No, 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 no. Comparing the church with the human body, Paul will later write, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor can the head say to the feet, well, <laughs> I don't need you. All the parts are needed. Everyone in God's church has a part to play in the advancement of his kingdom. In chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. He also emphasizes that each gift is meant to be exercised for the strengthening, the building up of the church. The old Methodist covenant service contains the following words. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and temporal interests. Others are contrary to both. In some we may please Christ and please ourselves. 
In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is assuredly given us in Christ who strengthens us. So let me ask, friends, what task has God given you to perform for him? Our calling as saints implies, thirdly, that we have a warfare to wage in God's strength. In, the case, in case any of the, the Corinthians thought that they had received everything God had to offer, Paul gently reminds them that they need the Lord Jesus to keep them strong to the end so that they will be blameless on the day of Christ. It was a spiritual warfare to which they were being called. And friends, it is sheer foolhardiness to try to fight that battle without the Lord's help. The Corinthians needed the same reminder that Dr. A.W. Tozer gave to 20th century Christendom, that this world is a battleground, not a playground. We're not here to frolic, but to fight. We must be prepared to answer the call, who is on the Lord's side? So long as our life continues here on earth, this battle will go on. It is real, deadly, and unrelenting. Christian, seek not yet repose. Cast your dreams of ease away. You are in the midst of foes. Watch and pray. Verse 9 has the assurance that God is faithful. We can trust him to do what he has promised, namely to keep us strong to the end. Paul will later on amplify the reminder of God's faithfulness. Over in chapter 10, verse 13, he says, He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. You know, the old ships used to have what they called a plimsoll line a black line around the side of the ship. And the ships were never to be loaded so that the plimsoll line was no longer visible. It was always to be above the water line. The load was never to be exceeded. And friends, I want to remind you that God knows where our plimsoll line is. And he will not let us be tested beyond our ability to endure. Our calling as saints implies finally a wait for Christ's return. Paul commends the Corinthians because they eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. This is not a passive kind of waiting, but an active, eager expectation. Dr. A.W. Tozer lamented the fact that many Christians nowadays are lukewarm about Christ's return. One of the reasons, of course, is that many have become so comfortable in this world that they have no real desire to leave it. Well, not yet anyway. They're a bit like the little boy who was asked at Sunday school if he wanted to go to heaven. He wasn't at all keen on the idea. When asked why, he replied, well, just before I left for Sunday school this morning, my mother baked an apple pie. Many Christians nowadays have been seduced by the adult version of apple pies, the pleasures that this world has to offer. But the Bible urges us to be watchful, alert and ready for our Lord's return. Jesus said to his disciple in Mark chapter 13, be on the lookout, be alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It will be like a man who goes away from home on a journey and leaves his servants in charge after giving to each one his work to do and telling the doorkeeper to keep watch. Watch then, because you do not know when the master of the house is coming. If he comes suddenly, he must not find you asleep. Well, let's wrap it up this morning. What then does our calling to be saints involve? First of all, a welcome to the family of God. Number two, a work to perform for God. Three, a warfare to wage for God. And finally, a wait.
for the return of God's Son. Let me share with you one final illustration. There's a little insect that lives beneath the slimy pools and makes for itself a house in the dark waters. It lives in the centre of an air bubble, which it inflates above the water and then takes down to the bottom of the pool. There, it moors the bubble to a small plant. There, in its little world of air, it breathes, builds its nest and rears its young. The little insect dwells below and yet lives above, breathing the air of the upper world while all around it are dark waters and murky depths. Friends, what a picture of Christians living in this world. We can't avoid being surrounded by its pitfalls and vices, but we can avoid being contaminated by them. Even in the here and now, we can experience something of what heaven is like. As Isaac Watts puts it in one of his most celebrated hymns, the men of grace have found glory begun below. Celestial, celestial fruit on earthly ground from faith and hope may grow. Friends, we are called to be saints. Let us strive by God's grace to carry out our high and holy calling, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky, to serve the present age my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we thank you for the high and holy privilege of being your people, of being saints. We thank you, O oh God, for the initiative that you took in reaching down to us in our lostness. And we thank you, O oh God, that we are your people, not because we deserve it, but because of all that the Lord Jesus has done. Help us, O oh God, to walk as befits those who acknowledge you as Saviour and Lord, and help us to walk with you until that day when we see you face to face. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.